Yeah, so now we're recording. Okay. All right, good. Uh, how many people do we have so far? We got 17 people. That's pretty good crowd. All right, so let's see what the first slide has to offer. And here it is. And I'm just going to bring a picture in picture here so you can see my pretty face still. All right, so synchronous generator idea. Okay, so we're going to, in, uh, we got some introduction to that uh, last time, but it was uh, pretty much like overall conceptual idea of, of how things are. Uh, today, we're going to go into some uh, more details of uh, what is actually happening and uh, to what and where and at what times. Um, and next time we meet each other, we're going to tackle some uh, uh, some problem solving uh, things. Okay, so we're going to do some mathematics next time we see each other. All right, so the introduction, the working principles, stator and rather A, and my favorite was summary. Okay, anyways. All right, come on. All right, what is synchronous generator? All right, okay, so here's. We get some animations happening here. So generator, uh, well, the basic idea is that is converting the uh, mechanical power into a electrical power. And you know, mechanical. There are different units for power. Uh, mechanical power can be expressed in watts, and uh, electrical power also can be expressed in watts. And if there are other units, uh, then uh, you know, like newton meters. That's for talk. Uh, uh, then uh, um, horsepower, then they are easily convertible from one to another. The key idea is that if you are tackling some problem, the idea is to work with the same units all the way along. Otherwise, you're going to get something that doesn't make sense. So generator converts. What do we have? We have we're applying. We are applying mechanical power in order to obtain electrical power. All right, or energy. Uh, synchronous, it contains, it consists of a rotor and stator, and the rotor and stator uh, turn at the same speed. Is that true based on what we have found so far? Or some people can say yes or no. The rotor and stator rotate at the same speed. Is it true or false in here? Because we're here, uh, we have the rotor and stator at the same speed. But I just expanded that phrase uh, into a sentence that says the rotor and the stator turn at the same speed. Anybody can uh, say is it true or false? True, we got one true, I think. All right, true. Okay. Well, uh, it, it, the answer is, uh, well, yes, in a sense, right? <laughs> Just have to understand that uh, uh, in the rotor, uh, in synchronous machine, we have the, uh, the, the field windings, okay? And this is the part that actually turns, the rotor turns. The stator has the stator windings and at the stator, what's happening with the stator? The stator doesn't turn. If the machine is used as a motor, the three phase power is applied into it, but the stator doesn't turn. The magnetic field, it creates a revolving magnetic field. Okay? So same thing with the generator. If we make the rotor spin, and if we magnetize the rotor, then if we apply that magnetic field onto the stationary coils that are positioned in certain way, we are going to create, uh, apply that magnetic field, rotating magnetic field around those coils, which are going to respond by generating something that's called an EMF, okay? And the EMF is going to create the current flow. Okay? So that's, uh, that's the key thing to understand with the uh, stator and, uh, and rotor when it comes to um, uh, synchronous machine. Okay. All right, what do we have here? Stator speed. Uh, all right, look at that. Stator speed, the stator magnetic field rotates. Rotor and stator field 
uh, rotor and stator field at different speed. A synchronous machine. Okay, so that will be asynchronous machine. Uh, it will be uh, it it they they might have different speed, but synchronous uh, sorry asynchronous machine or induction motor. We're going to talk about that later. That's the squirrel cage motor, which we covered a little bit of idea of how that works uh, last time we talked about. Uh, so, uh, uh, in fact, the uh, the synchronous machine has a tiny bit of an element of a uh, induction motor in it in order to uh, to be able to start on its own. Otherwise, uh, it would not be. But you know what? Uh, we're going to talk about that later. So. Uh, okay, input, we have mechanical power and output, we, ha we have the three phase electricity. Where is it used? Primary source of electric energy for power stations, hydro, thermal, nuclear, and so on. So we have a hydro power station here. What can we uh, see? I wonder, can you see my mouse? Yes, you should be able to see my mouse here. Right? Uh, so hydropower station, what do we have here? We have a water flow going through this shaft or channel here. And that water flow makes that turbine spin. And what is going to make that here? You know, the field windings are going to be spun around the uh, stator windings. And that thing's going to be huge. And of course, uh, we're going to use the transformer to transform the energy. Um, and we're going to send that power so you could uh, uh, you know so you could uh, plug your computer into the wall and uh, talk to your girlfriend or boyfriend on the uh, on the internet okay so uh, by the way transformers uh, just as a side note transformers what do they transform there are three things that they transform yeah, AC to DC. Yeah. Um, if you're talking about okay, so here's the thing that uh, that uh, the little um, um, device that has those two prongs that you plug in. Uh, quite often, they're being called a transformer because it contains a transformer, but uh, it contains uh, it's actually a power supply. The part of it is a transformer. But transformer will not uh, transform AC onto a DC, unless you know there's always uh, there's always a way that you can rewire things and you can just cheat that thing into things. But never say never. But uh, that's not the idea. Transformers uh, transform what uh, a current. So I give you the uh, um, first uh, clue here. So they transform the current. What else do, do they transform? Voltage. Okay, so that's the second quantity that uh, we have here. Thank you, Andrew. All right, now, uh, what will be the third thing? What do they transform? Power is there, but the power is not transformed. The third thing is, uh, and so, well, a lot of people I don't remember about that one. Okay, so they transform the current. They transform the voltage. They transform the impedance. Uh, but they keep the power. All right. So that's they are wonderful devices. Uh, all right. So uh, this is the hydro power station, the big one that we have not too far from us, maybe like about two and a half hours of driving, would be where? Somebody else is watching this thing on YouTube. I'm going to get a pretty idea of where about we are here. Um, any city that comes, Niagara Falls, there we go. That's where we have it, good. All right, you guys are smart. All right, now here is the thermal power station uh, that, no, that uses coal or oil or natural gas, anything that produces heat. The most efficient one, of course, is the nuclear one. Uh, but there's always, uh, you know, can't win, you know, you, 
Um, you pollute the environment by burning so much coal into generating power. Uh, so you're polluting the environment directly. Then uh, the cleanest, uh, that uh, it's claimed, the cleanest uh, power that you get is the nuclear, but you still end up with the nuclear waste. So you know what? We are trapped on this planet uh, in our skin as humans. Uh, so uh, we just uh, you know can't win one way or the other. But anyways, uh, so here is the coal supply. Oops, there's the... Uh, coal supply and there's a boiler here that burns the uh, that burns the uh, the coal to generate heat. Uh, the heat uh, uh, heats up a steam and the steam starts moving and it's going to make the turbine spin or rotate. And then uh, <clears throat> uh, in, in same idea, we're going to have a, gener a synchronous generator to generate a power three phase power okay and we have here what do we have is a transformer that transforms this uh, power into a three phase voltage high voltage because high voltage uh, transporting high voltage over the longer distance is the most efficient way and then later on you step it down uh, and then you get back the current because in transformers you raise the current the voltage lowers you raise the voltage the current lowers so i know that as i said transformers are wonderful things and as far as that as you know, we're not going to be concerned about that stuff that's called condenser is basically <laughs> something that's going to cool down the steam just so uh, so it can be heated up again and we get some circulation going all right, so here is the idea of a thermal power station that uses coal, oil, natural gas, uh, um, and whatnot. Uh, it can also go nuclear here, okay? Working principle of a uh, synchronous machine. Let me just call up the whole slide here. So we don't, uh, uh, okay, all right. We're going to stop at this slide and we're going to come back to this slide. It's just like back to the future. All right. Now, uh, let me bring me and myself here onto the big screen. And uh, we're going to go over some things. And I was just, there's so much stuff that I want to put together for you. And it's in certain ways. So we're just going to start from the basics, okay? All right, let's say we have a, a conductor. Let's see, I'm gonna draw it this way here. Can you see things? Yes, you can. Here, here is a magnified version of a conductor, all right? Yeah, so we have a conductor. Now, let's see, we have uh, a current flow through that conductor. And let's say we're going to make the current flow, let's put this marker here, this way. So obviously this is the more positive side of the conductor and this is the more negative side of the conductor if the conductor is on a receiving end of, uh, of the applied power. If the conductor is um, um, supplying the EMF electromotive force, then we're going to have minus here and plus here. So depending on where the conductor is. Right, so now we're going to use the right-hand rule here. But, okay, so there's so many right-hand rules, uh, left-hand rules and also, uh, and, and, and whatnot. Now we're going to talk about the conventional current flow, conventional here. Conventional current, conventional current flow. And I'm going to change the markers because this one I think has had it. All right. So general rule of using the hand rules is usually when you're talking about conventional current flow, which on the receiving end of any device uh, is going to uh, assume that uh, the current flows from the positive to the negative side of a terminal. 
Uh, we're going to use the right hand rules. And because I'm filming myself through a mirror, I'm going to have to raise my right left hand. So that's going to look like I'm raising my right hand. So, so the right hand rules we are using for the conventional current flow and the left hand rules we're going to uh, use for the electron flow. Okay, and the electron flow goes obviously from minus to positive. But you know what? For this, uh, let's just stick with one. And the most popular one uh, is uh, pretty much the uh, conventional current flow, which is if something is on the receiving end, uh, then, uh, then the uh, current is going to flow from the positive to the negative side of whatever it is. Okay, so this conductor is on the receiving end. All right. Okay, now I'm going to draw a right hand here. Hopefully that's going to work. So uh, if we go this way here and here, here, these are fingers, okay? One, two, three, and four, all right? These are fingers. And if it is a right hand rule, right hand, okay, then the other side of the hand is going to have your thumb right here. That's going to be your thumb. Okay, can you see that? All right. So if you grab that conductor, don't grab live conductors. Imagine that you grab, you're grabbing that conductor. So you're going to grab that thing with your right hand and wrap your, uh, uh, wrap your, hand around it. I, I'm, I'm just going to draw it. I'm just going to use my hands here. Uh, then uh, you're going to uh, point your thumb into the flow of a current. All right. And your fingers are going to point to the direction of a magnetic field. Okay. That is going to be around that. Okay, so I'm pretty sure you already know that, but the, 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 the symbols that we use is just like a symbol of an arrow. Here's the tip of an arrow, so that's just a tip. And here are the feathers, all right, of the veins. So if you look at that thing straight, if the arrow is coming at you, you're going to see that dot and if the arrow is leaving you you're going to see those feathers so and by this logic we're going to apply the symbols here and over here is going to be a dot okay. if there was uh, so we got that out of the way i uh, i'm giving you some of the hand rules but i don't want you to i don't want to give you too many hand rules because you're just going to get tangled around it uh, and uh, you're going to try to remember which hand rule to use for what and then uh, you know, a month later i'm going to go here and there and uh, i'm just going to give you some basic ones today we're going to talk about just two hand rules and everything else is going to be understanding around that okay so we got that out of the way okay now All right, erase, erase, wait for it to dry, and erase with the dry one here. That's what we're basically we go here. Right, what we have, what's going to happen when we have two conductors? Mm -hmm. We have two conductors. Here's one. Can we see things? I'm just gonna draw it here. There's one conductor. Uh, Here's another conductor. Okay. And let's say both conductors have the same current flowing in the same direction. What is going to happen? Of course, if we apply the right hand rule, just as we did, uh, the magnetic field is going to go in one like that. And the other, the other one is going to go also that way here. All right. What is going to happen is those two magnetic fields are going to have tendencies to align as one. So the cables are going to have tendencies to be pulled together. 
Now, if you have, if you uh, change the di current direction in the uh, in one of the wires, the fields are not going to try to come on top of each other and work together in synchronization. If you can, I don't want to use that word actually, you know, as one. Uh, the, because it, what's going to happen? That is going to try to create in when when they uh, when they flow when the currents flow in both conductors in the same way. So the the wires are going to have tendencies to be pulled together. And if you have uh, wires, two wires that have enough electricity going, and you're talking high, uh, high current, uh, if you lay them on the floor, they're actually going to come close together, right? But you have to have a lot of the current flowing. If the current flows the opposite way, they are going to separate, okay? because the current, the magnetic fields are going to work around each other and every single one of those, they, they just want to try to have their own space to work with, okay? All right, yeah, I'll have a sheet here. Um, now, if, if we put, I think that's why I'm not wiping it too fast. There you go. All right. When uh, we get, um, let's say this one uh, conductor is on a receiving, uh, well, let's see this way here. Here, and then there's another conductor. Okay. And both of them are connected. One of them is going to be on the receiving end. And the other one is going to be connected to a power supply. All right, let's see, this is going to be the positive, this is going to be the negative, all right? Now here's the trickiness that comes here. Let's say this one, the current flows this way here. This one is connected to a battery, so here's the positive. Current is going to flow here, and it's going to flow here. Uh, now, when uh, same, uh, you ready? Now, it's going to go that way here, right? That's the idea of conventional current. Yeah, there we go. Right. Uh, we have other hand rules in other classes. It's confusing. Yes. Yes, that's why I'm trying to give you the understanding. And later on, see the thing about hand rules. Um, uh, when we're talking about hand rules, you're going to get first the idea, the good idea. It's a good idea to get some understanding. And then you're going to apply some of the hand rules of some of your favorite ones. And sometimes you might want to invent some of your own ones, okay? Uh, how much current are we talking about uh, in that example to conductors with uh, current in the same direction? Well, um, hmm. when your battery looks like uh, the size of a barrel, right? <laughs> and you like those wires, uh, then you're talking about that, that the wires are going to uh, come together. So uh, it could be like 200 amps, 300 amps, okay? Um, 50 amps, All right? Now, uh, I used to have a teacher who passed away, Mr. Fred Jurchuk. Uh, he was experiment. He was a teacher in Fenshaw College in like early 90s or before that. Uh, and he was actually, uh, uh, he was experimenting with things like that. Um, and he actually got those things going. That's why he mentioned those barrels. Anyways, um, so what's going to happen? We're going to have a magnetic field. That way, if you apply your right hand rule, the one that I just showed you, just basically grab grab the wire with your right well, with your right hand, and your thumb is going to show you the uh, direction of the current. Okay. Uh, so that is going to generate a field around it. If you bring this wire close enough to it, all right. What is going to happen is that magnetic field is going to affect this wire and it's going to create a current flow in the same direction. Okay. So if we have a DC source, 
and we bring another wire close to that, are we going to have a current flowing through this resistor? It's a tricky question. What is going to happen? Somebody said no. Hmm. Do we have any other no's? Do we have any yeses happening here? Ah, there you go, Rodrigo. Here's, uh, here's the thing. Well, are we going to, if we bring this wire close to that other wire, are we going to have the current flow at all? Anybody? No. Well, we are going to have a little bit of current flow at the moment that we bring that closer together and then it's going to die out because things are going to equalize. There's going to be no change because we're talking about DC. Right. So when we bring it, yes, we're going to have a little bit of a thing going on here and it's going to die out. So we're going to have a little bit of a spike. Right. Now, what's going to happen if we change this Into what? AC power supply. Are we going to have a... Now, of course, the magnetic fields are going to alternate, right? This way, so the magnetic field is going to go... By the way, uh, you don't have to use the hand rule for the, the... If you have conventional current flow, you don't have to use the hand rules. Any wine drinkers here that use... Uh, that drink some quality wine, uh, remember the corkscrew idea? You turn it to the right, all right? Um, and the corkscrew goes towards the bottle. All right? So if you have a corkscrew, or just go to the liquor store and buy a corkscrew and get yourself a bottle of wine and you're going to understand electricity. <laughs> that was a bad joke. All right. uh, <clears throat> uh, so uh, the corkscrew rule, the same thing. Okay, so when we uh, uh, when we have the AC source here, yes, of course we're going to have a current flow, and it's going to be alternating current. All right, so that's where I'm going at uh, with this whole thing. We need to have a change. All right, we are going somewhere with this. Trust me, guys. Yeah. Wet and dry. Okay. I was sitting making the notes and trying to kind of put this whole thing together in a way that, uh, okay, what did I say here? All right. Let's say we have two, well, it's going to look like monopoles, but they're not. Yeah. All right, so here's one pole, and it's going to be the north pole here. And we have here, going to have the south pole here, and it's going to have the same thing. And of course, yeah, let's make it nice and pretty. Mm -hmm. So of course the magnetic field is going to go from the North Pole to the South Pole, right? That's going to be the direction of the magnetic field. Right? Okay, so now let's see, uh, let's say we have a conductor going in it. Right? There's a conductor inside that. So when we have the, the field acting up on this conductor of a certain strength, uh, are we going to have a current flow? Uh, 
Uh, was that uh, no? Yes, it's no. <laughs> yeah, no. All right. Now, <clears throat> if we're going, if we increase the current, the, if we increase the um, strength of the magnetic field, are we going to have a current flow in this conductor? Looking at the chat line here. Come on, guys, wake up. We haven't started yet. There we go. Chris said yes. Of course we're going to have, because we have a change of the magnetic field. So if we connect a resistor here into this conductor, we're going to have some current flow to the resistor R, OK? Now, what's going to happen when the change, let's say the field goes stronger. What do we have here? Okay, we can go that way. Uh, what is going to happen when the field gets stronger? Because I'm trying to get at of trying to find out which way the current is going to flow in this um, in this conductor. Right. And I'm going to give you a little bit of a formula, which you probably already know. A lot of you guys know that. There's going to be E equals, let's see here. There's a delta phi over delta time. Okay. Of course, we're going to have to apply sign time because when it when something changes, it always changes over time. So that we can't escape but to have time. So uh, we're going to change the flux. Now, what is the flux? Flux is the, in short words, flux is the magnetic field that matters in our case. So when we make the field stronger, which way is it that the current is going to flow? And how are we going to polarize the resistor? There we go, the stupid palm ring that we get. <laughs> okay, so now, um, if the field gets stronger, the way it is, remember the lines are pointing down, Which way is the current flowing, going to flow in this thing here? I'm going to give you the Faraday's law right now. Did I, uh, did I put that thing here in writing? Yes, I did. The Faraday's law states if the current, if the if if the magnetic field around the conductor changes, then the conductor is going to create an EMF, which is electromotive force, which is going to cause a current, which is going to cause the magnetic field opposing the change of the magnetic field that was changed. <laughs> Anybody got that? Right. So basically, when the magnetic field changes, this thing is going to produce a magnetic field that opposes the change. And in order for that thing to have a magnetic field around it, it has to have a current flow. So that means it has to have a polarity. So what is it going to produce? Let's, so let's, let's go backwards on this thing here. How is this thing going to react in order to create the opposition of the so now the field is the strongest 
in the middle here. Okay, that's the strongest field. And as we go along, as we go further around apart, the field is getting weaker. So we're going to concentrate on the middle part of that in order to get our directions. So if you use the right hand rule, the part of the wire that is closer to the middle is going to have to produce the opposite magnetic field in order to create the current flow. Well, they kind of complement each other, the magnetic field and the current flow. So they just have to be according to that right hand rule. When you grab the wire with the right hand, uh, it, the thumb is going to show you the, 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 um, the current flow. So which way does the magnetic field, just as I said, working backwards, which way does the magnetic field have to be around that in order to oppose the change in the middle of this whole scenario here? Is the, does the magnetic field around this wire, if you just take that and just go, Turn it that way here. So we're just going to have a, uh, let's say, um, can we do this here? Okay. Here is north, here is south pole. Right. Here is our conductor, right? We just turn it, so it just points right now. And the magnetic field is going this way here, of course, from north to south. Okay. And the strongest in the middle here. Right. So when the magnetic field that's pointing this way gets stronger, how is this wire going to react? Current flow towards us or away from us. All right. So let's say, yeah, okay. Well, the current, the, the um, um, which way is the magnetic field does it have to, to, to spin? Well, let's say we're going to bring all right, let's say we're going to bring this conductor. So let's say the, uh, this, this whole, uh, okay, so there's a magnetic field that is constant and we're going to bring the wire in here, all right? Which means we're going to have that side of this wire is going to be exposed to the magnetic field. So the magnetic field around this wire is going to change on this side first. So which way does it have to spin in order to oppose the, whatever has to be opposed. Is it going to have to spin this way? Or does it have to spin this way? Clockwise or counterclockwise? Number one or number two? It has to oppose the magnetic field that it's introduced to. Right. Here's the trick. The magnetic field around this wire could be of whatever magnitude, let's say it is zero. It's not spinning at all. So when we bring this wire into this magnetic field, this side of this wire here, it is going to have the change going which way? This thing is going to become more north than it was before. And this thing is going to become more south than it was before. So the change, okay, the change is actually going this way. 
That's where the change is going. Because the, remember, in Faraday's law, the magnetic field that is going to be in the conductor is going to oppose the change. Here's the key word. It's going to oppose the change. So the change is going this way in that around that wire. So we're going to have to spin that this way, the magnetic field around this conductor. So we're going to have a conductor like this with the field spinning this way here. So let's draw the fingers. Yeah. And we use the right hand rule here. That's our thumb. Okay. So it's going to go this way. It's going to cause the current flow that way, that way, yeah. away from us. I want you to get the idea that the magnetic field that's going to be induced in the wire is going to oppose not what exists, it's going to oppose the change. That's the key. And based on that, a current, conventional current going that way is going to be uh, created. Now, when we have this wire, the EMF is going to be induced here. What's the polarity of this actual conductor here? Right? Is it going to be this way? Or is it going to be that way? Is it going to be A or B? We got A's, we got B's, we got B here. Uh, and B, we got two B's and we got one A, but David changed uh, his, uh, his mind, all right? So it's going to be this way. That's gonna be the polarity, good. Because? Because why? Because, come on, some of the answer. Give me an idea. Something that I showed, I, I told you yesterday, I mean yesterday, last week. Conventional current, well, let's say what conventional current is. We have a battery here that's positive, that's negative. We have a resistor going through and it's connected to the battery. Oh. Yeah. So you could see it. Okay, here's our circuit. So the current flows from here to there. So this is the more positive, this is more negative, but that's in the resistor. The resistor is on the receiving end. Yeah, so that's what we're talking about the voltage drop. Any device that has a voltage drop is going to have positive, negative, and conventional current flow is going to go from positive to negative, from more positive side to the more negative side. But look what's happening. We have the current flowing this way, and what is happening inside the battery? The current flows from negative to positive because What's, dri what's the driving force? Electromotive force is inside that battery that drives the current. This is the giver, this is the receiver here. Okay. So basically when we introduce, when we shove that wire inside the magnetic field, we are making a battery out of this rod which means the polarity is going to be 
this is going to be more negative side. This is going to be more positive side. Because how do I know that? How to, uh, uh, you know, if, if you get confused later on, well, if we connect that to a resistor, we're going to create a current flow. And it's going to flow from positive to negative, and it's going to flow that way, right? Okay, so, so that's the current flow. Okay. Let's see here. The current flow, we determined that this, by our losing our using our thumb here, that with the current flows this way, and we connect something like a resistor, so this is going to be positive negative okay which means that's going to be negative it's going to be positive so we're creating emf we are making a battery out of this thing here and next page let's raise enjoying this thing so far this is a fascinating trip. At least I think so. <laughs> uh, let me follow my own train of thought that I had. Yeah. Okay. Let's have something that is a coil. Instead of having just a rod, we're just going to have a coil. All right, so we have, again, we have a north pole, we have a south pole. With that, yeah. So of course the magnetic field is going this way here. Um, and, what do we have here? I just draw a coil. So let's have a coil here. I'm going to do a bit more of those later on. I'm going to pretend that this thing is perpendicular, but in order to do that, I wouldn't be able to draw it. So you could see, I'll just draw a straight line. So, okay. So just, just assume that the whole thing is perpendicular, like just like that. Okay. There's the, uh, Axis here. Right. All right. So let's say the magnetic field strength is, and okay, so here I'm just going to connect that into a resistor. It's likely connection, but hey. And let's say this uh, length of this side here is, uh, what did I put here? 0 0.2 meters, 20 centimeters, so 0 0.2 meters. And this side here of the square coil is 0 0.5 meters. Fifty centimeters, half a meter. Okay. And the flux. What's the acting flux on this thing? All right. So the uh, let's say the B magnetic field B initially is ten teslas. Now remember. I was encouraging you to always write the um, units. Try to get into a habit of writing units in square brackets. Right. So are we going to have any current flow in this coil when we just have this thing? We have already have established that because there is no change. There's not going to be a current flow. Okay, now let's see that the B changes. So B1, B2 changes into 50 Teslas. I'm just grabbing the numbers. Yeah. So the field changed, the magnetic field strength 
has changed from 10 Teslas to 50 Teslas. What is the flux? Or well, the flux is the field times the area that this coil is going to have that. This is like grade 12 physics, but hey. All right, so um, what is going to be the flux uh, initially? So flux one equals uh, B times area. Yeah, all right. What's the B? The B is 10 Teslas, first one equals uh, 10 Teslas times, what do we have? 0 0.1, so 0 0.2, 0 0.1 times 0 0.2 times 0 0.1, 0 0.2, 0 0.5. Meters, meters. Okay. So what do we have here? That's gonna give us, uh, what do I have? If you calculate this whole thing, 0 0.2 times 0 0.5 is going to give us 0 0.1, 0 0.1 times 10, that is going to be, or it is, one, and then Tesla meter square. So that's the flux one that we have, okay? The field changes into 50 Teslas. So flux at the, um, Second instance is again B times A. We're going to go 50 Teslas times 0 0.2 times 0 0.5. So 50 times 0 0.1, because that gives us 0 0.2 times half, it's going to give us 0 0.1 which is going to give us uh, 50 times 0.1, five Teslas, right? So what's the delta phi, the change in flux is going to be? The change in flux, delta of the flux will be flux two minus flux one, which is going to give us four Tesla meter square. All right. Following me so far? We're trying to find out what the voltage is going to be created here. What's the current? What's the EMF? Right. So the EMF will be uh, delta of the flux, change in flux over change in time. Well, let's say it took two seconds to change. So time one, I have two times. Time one, oh, I can't have that, I can see that. Um, time, time one equals two seconds. Well, it helps here, because when you, you do a handwriting here, if you put two seconds, it might look like 25, but look, I put the brackets, the square brackets around the units, so I know that's two seconds here. Yeah. So what do we have here? We're going to have uh, delta 
flux equals four, right? Four over two, I think it was two volts around here, because we're talking about the area here. So that's gonna give us two volts. Now, what's going to happen if we change the time? To one second. No. We're going to have the same thing, but instead of two, we're going to have one. So it's going to be four over one. That's going to give us four volts. Does that make sense? I think it does. Where does this make sense? I'm going to answer my own question here because I don't want to wait. We are cutting the time in half, which means we are applying the change more drastically. We are applying the change more drastically. We're going to create more voltage. If there is no change, there is no current flow, no EMF generated. If there is a little bit of a change over the time, they're going to take longer, things are going to go slower, it's going to be a little bit current. If there's going to be a rapid change, of course, we're going to have more, um, more current generating. So if you have uh, an alternator, current generator. If you spin slower, you're going to create less voltage. If you spin faster, you're going to create more voltage. The light bulb is going to light up stronger. You know, that's so that's, uh, you know, it makes sense so far, right? Okay. So which way is the current going to flow? Let's just say we're going to concentrate towards the middle. So let's just get that, uh, the, the, towards the middle of the magnetic field here. So first of all, where is the change? The change is happening because this thing is getting stronger. So the change goes this way, all right? So in order to oppose that change, the magnetic field is going to have to go this way. If you apply the right hand rule, the current is going to flow this way, which means this is the negative side, this is the positive side. So this is going to be the positive side. It's going to be the negative side. Of course, that's going to be the negative side. We're going to have the current flow that way. Okay. All right. Now we have that out of the way. And we have done this. Uh, yeah. There's one more thing here that we have to apply. Sometimes you're going to see a number on the letter. So EMF equals, come on, let me just go equals here. <laughs> All right, equals um, change of flux over the change of time. The quicker you change the flux, the more energy you create. It makes sense. Right? But that's when we have only one term. Now, if we go like this and we have 
two turns here. There's going to be two turns. So of course the area is going to increase. So we just have to multiply everything by two. We have three turns and you get the idea. So we're going to have the N here. The N represents number of turns. The more turns you're going to have, the more. So of course, if you got two turns, you're going to create eight balls. If you just move it in one second right? and so on. Okay. Now, speaking of that here, understanding all this, we're going to come back to that first, to that slide. If you remember anything out of this one here, try to remember in order to determine the direction of the current flow is that we are considering not the original flux lines or the magnetic field lines, field lines. We're considering the direction of change. Okay. All right, so now we have this slide right here. Do you guys want to take a little break? We got uh, right now, it's four, uh, five after four. You want to just take a little break to uh, to uh, uh, refresh or catch the uh, catch a breath. Make yourself a new cup of coffee because we're gonna we're gonna keep going with this. We got two hours here. Or did you already everyone fall asleep? Sounds good. All right. So let's get. Um, okay. So it's. Uh, I'm going to pick up the phone here now. Call you back. Come on, stop ringing. Uh, it's 4.05, let's just take, uh, you know what, take 10 minutes, so quarter after five, we're going to come back here and uh, uh, resume. And I'm going to pause, to hit the pause here in the recording. So please remind me to, um, um, to hit the recording again, if I forgot, if I forget. So five plus 10 on your phones, let's synchronize the watch. Okay, I was going to say, let's synchronize our watches. <clears throat> okay, we're back. All right, back is back. All right, can we, uh, let me just, excuse me here. Uh, all right. So uh, we were going to look at this uh, this slide here, back to this slide for a little bit. Uh, now there is another another formula here that we're going to introduce that we are or uh, you have downloaded this thing a week ago, so you should uh, should see this formula here. Uh, now, um, what do we have here? We have a conductor going uh, in uh, in this direction and we have a uh, north and south pole here so the magnetic field is going from top to the bottom and we have a formula here now i'm not going to derive the formula because frankly i would have to get ready to derive that but uh, there is a way of deriving it uh, from what we just uh, did okay but that would be like another half an hour. Anyways, the EMF induced in this conductor, because now we're talking about moving conductor, the field is stationary. 
because we're talking about electric motors and electric generators. So of course we're going to end up with having uh, moving parts. Uh, I suppose you can hear me because nobody says anything. Oh, what's that uh, chat here? I'll make another coffee, but you made me want wine. <laughs> All right. Okay, well, that's because of uh, the corkscrew, right? Okay, uh, got it. All right, so what do we have here? We have a stationary field and we have a conductor moving towards the right. And here's another right-hand rule I'm going to introduce you to. If you point your right hand, yeah, so let me just see if I can get this uh, pan going. Can I see it? There it is. All right. Control eraser. Yeah, control pan again. Yeah, I can see my cursor now. So if you point the, your hand, yeah, four fingers and that's the, here's your lifeline and here's whatever, right? So that means that's, the, <laughs> that's, that's a hand, okay? Four fingers. Uh, so uh, that's the palm, that's the inside of your palm right now. Yeah, that's it, okay? Um, and if you have that magnetic field hitting your palm, the inside of your palm, your thumb, that's your right hand, your thumb is going to point to the motion of this wire. And if you align your right hand side, right hand, so your thumb points to the motion and the magnetic field hits the inside of your palm, you're going to uh, point to the polarity of the EMF in this conductor. So can we apply the other right hand rule? Now we gotta be, we gotta, we, we still have to, it's, it's still a bit tricky, but it's not when you come to understanding that, okay? In this conductor here, where is the change being introduced? Because before this conductor, let's say this conductor was here before, okay? Um, the magnetic field around that conductor was whatever, maybe let's say, you know, zero. It's just sitting on the bottom here. That's a, not a minus, it's just basically a sitting here at this level. Right? Now, the change in the conductor, the change around the conductor's field is going to be introduced to, to pointing upwards because this, this side of the conductor is gonna hit the field first. So the change is going to happen that way as the conductor sees it, okay? All right, so now the change of the conductor change is applied here, that way. It's supposed to be a straight line. And of course, we're going to have to make an op opposite change because things happen in the opposition opposing kind of way. So the magnetic field is going to spin this way here to oppose the change. Right. And of course, if you grab that with your right hand roll that I showed you before, if you grab that conductor with your right hand, where your fingers a pointing, aligning with the magnetic field that's going to be around the conductor, your thumb is going to point this way. So that's the current flow. And of course, because we are making a battery out of that, because we're creating, we're having, dealing with the EMF. So the polarity of EMF is from minus to plus, and that's the way it current flows. So it makes sense. Now, here is the BLV, all right? 
The B stands for magnetic field, the, and it's in Teslas. The L stands for the length of the conductor, the active length of the conductor, which means the length of the conductor that's exposed to the field. Okay. And V stands for velocity, and it's in meters per second. No problem so far. If we just uh, move that conductor inside that uh, the, 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 the magnetic field, that is what is going to happen. Okay. So again, we're just going to, uh, there's that formula here, E equals B L V. So here's EMF and that's going to be in volts. B here is the magnetic field, magnetic. And that is in Tesla units, length of the conductor, active length, active length of the conductor, conductor, and that is in meters. And over here is the velocity or speed. And it is in meters per second. So that's uh, the EMF that is going to be induced in this conductor as it passes through the magnetic field. Whoa, wrong screen. Another piece of paper. Well, um, let's just, uh, let's just uh, take a look at some things here. And I'm going to go, try to go quicker. Later on, next time we see each other, we're going to get, we're going to get some uh, problems to solve, calculating some, some things, all right? So let's see, let's say we have a, um, well, conductor moving in a circular motion here. So here is our circle, okay. That's our center of the circle. That's where our conductor is moving here, all right. That's our conductor, it's perpendicular to the circle. And it's, uh, you know, it, it's, it's moving. All right, let's say counterclockwise. So we're talking about the speed. Let's say that thing is at the very top. Here's the bottom, here are the sides of this circle here. Now, if we get the RPMs, which are revolutions or rotations per minute, so that's gonna be revolutions per minute. How can we, uh, and let's say this is our magnetic field here, north and south, okay? So with the reference to the magnetic field, here are the magnetic field, here's the magnetic field going. What we're looking at is how quickly or how fast this, conductor is cutting through the magnetic field at the right angle perpendicularly. So here are the, how fast is it hitting at the right angle? So of course it's going to be fastest when it's right here. Where else is it going to be fastest at the right angle? It's going to be here because it's going to go that way, right? Where is it going to be the slowest? 
the slowest is going to be here because over here, this thing is not moving either that way or is it not moving in it that way? Because if it's here, if it's it's still moving this way, but it's not as fast as it's here because we're traveling around the circle. So if we have the revolutions per minute, we can calculate the circumference of the circle and we can just stretch it as a straight line. And that is going to be our length. And it's going to travel so many lengths per second, per minute. Because revolutions, this is a revolution from here to here. If we stretch that, calculate, so it's two pi r, right? So uh, that is going to be the speed at which this conductor cuts at the right angle. Over here, also cuts at the right angle, but it also has a bit of that way velocity, the, the, the motion. Uh, so it's not going to be traveling as fast that way because part of it is going to go to making a circle, right? So over here, it cuts fastest, it's getting slower, 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 and then it's that way, it's going to be at zero. And then it's going to start going this way. So it's just like if, uh, if you look at this uh, in a 2D instead of 3D, it's going to go this way, all right? Just like that. Right here, 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 here. I'm trying to <laughs> trying to do that. Yeah, okay. Um, so if we uh, uh, divide that uh, rotations per minute divided by sixty, because a minute has sixty seconds, if you divide it by sixty, you're going to get the revolutions per second, and then if you calculate the distance um of that whatever it is uh which is going to be 2 pi r because this is the radius uh, then you're going to be able to calculate the speed at this instance at this very instance and uh, how long is it going to stay there it is going to stay there one tenth of a second is it going to stay there one millionth of a second well it is undefined because it is just going to stand for momentary, momentarily, okay? It's going to travel the fastest that way. And here it's going to travel fastest that way. Okay. Well, based on that, if you go E equals B L V, V is the spe speed. Here's the um, uh, length of the conductor. If you have the length of the conductor, if you have the speed and if you have the strength of the magnetic field, you will be able to find out what the voltage generator or the EMF is generator generated at that moment here when it travels, when it cuts the field at the right angle, the fastest. So well, that is going to be the maximum, the E peak, the peak value here. But we want to know all those instances. I know, we know that it's going to go from the peak, positive peak to the negative peak. And because it's traveling around the circle, so obviously we're going to end up with something like this. We're going to end up with a waveform. And let's say this is going to be the top one here. So that's going to be the X axis, the Y axis, and it's going to be our X axis. No, uh, no, it's not going to be here. Our x axis is going to be right in the middle of that. Okay, so this is going to be our time. And this is going to be our voltage or EMF. Yeah. Okay. So this is going to be the peak which travels here. And that's going to be the peak when it travels that way. And there in, anywhere in between, it's going to come back to the peak right here after it completes the full revolution. So now we want to try to find out what the voltages, what the voltages are going to be between here and here, between here and here, between here and here, and so on. So one thing we're going to see is that when the conductor travels from here, anywhere from here to here, actually, um, yeah, from here, anywhere to here. That is going to be the positive cycle. 
And over here, it's going to be the negative cycle. So anywhere from here, it's going to go that way. And then your friend is going to travel the other way, um, the negative cycle of that. We want to find out what the speed is at this point, what the speed is at this point, and not the speed that this travels along this circle, but we want to find out what is so-called angular velocity, which means we want to find out how fast is it traveling this way or that way? That's all we care about. And based on that, how fast it travels, it cuts the magnetic field. Based on that, we can find out what the induced voltage is going to be in this conductor. So let's just, you know what, I'm just going to, just for the more clarification here, I'm going to erase that little rod, the conductor here. And I'm going to complete the circle. All right. So at this point, when it travels through this point, at this point, we draw a line through it. That is going to be our zero line. That's going to be our instance right here. And we know when it travels here, through that point right here, that is going to be this point. So that's going to be the peak value of whatever we're going to have. If it's a if it, if you are generating hundreds volt hundred volts peak to peak, that's going to be a hundred volts here, or a fifty volts peak to peak, right? Uh, so that, anyways, that's going to be the most the maximum value positive, and that's going to be the maximum value negative here. All right. So let's just take that as just to have some kind of references, something to compare that to. Let's just assume that this is going to be our one and everything else, and that's going to be minus one here. So here is gonna be one. No, well, let me just draw it here. It's gonna be one, it's gonna be minus one. Over here is gonna be zero, and over here is going to be zero. And anywhere in between here is going to be a fraction. So if we find out the values between here, we find out the fraction values between here and here, we can use that as a multiplier because if we have if we if we give this thing a value of one, everything else is going to be a fraction of one. We can use that fraction to multiply whatever we are generating. And that is going to give us the value comparing to comparison value of whatever it is. So if over here, the, uh, the, the, the value is going to be, let's say 0 0.7, then, um, uh, then whatever the generated peak voltage by the uh, the EMF uh, generated in the conductor. We just have to multiply it by 0 0.7. We're going to get the real value of what it is. Okay. So let's just draw a line here. That is going to be sort of like 45 degrees, let's say, our angle. So if everything else is going to be the fraction, it's going to be a fraction of that one. So it's going to kind of come up to here. So it's going to be the fraction of this one. Well, what do we have here? We have a right angle here. Okay. And if we're doing this, if we have a one here and we have a sine wave, or actually here is a cosine wave. All right. So here's our zero degrees. That's not the time. That's our omega t change in the angle. So that's zero degrees here. 
uh, we have one. Well, what can we tie this to? What can we get this? Oh, wait a second. A cosine of one, sorry, a cosine of zero is one. Well, you know what? Let's we got something to 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 to, to go by. All right. That's not, we're not dealing with three phase yet. All right, we're getting to that. We're just dealing with just one conductor spinning around the circle between the North and South Pole. And it's hitting, it's cutting the, it's cutting at the right angle, the, um, the magnetic field at certain speed. It's still moving this way, but not as fast as this point, right? And over here, it's not moving either that way or not. So that's just the angular velocity is zero. Right? So I remember the, uh, all right here. So Katoa, all right? Sine, cosine, tangent, all right? So over here we have cosine adjacent and hypotenuse. So here it is. If you, if you look at the trigonometry here, so here's the 45 degree angle. Here is the hypotenuse, because always going to be the hypotenuse here. Here's the opposite. Here's the adjacent. So adjacent to the hypotenuse is going to give us this length. We are looking for this length right here, from here to here at this point, because that's going to give us the fraction that we have to multiply this, whatever it is here, to get this value. And if it's one, it's got, so let's say whatever is like 45 degrees here, um, All right. They want to keep the this card. Okay. So just for kicks. Okay. So if I put uh, if I put forty five degrees cosine, that's going to be zero point seven. So over here we have zero point seven by zero point seven. So when the rotor spins and it's at this point, that is going to give us 0 0.7 of 0 0.7 fraction, 70% uh, fraction, fraction of whatever the total peak is. And if we keep going this way, keep going, so keep calculating those, we're going to end up with a, with a sine wave like that. It's actually the cosine wave. That's, whoops, you can see what I'm saying here. If we go, if you go that way here, keep going, keep going, keep going. If you calculate the cosine values, so we just need to going to calculate the values of this. And then we're going to come up with a wave like this. According to whatever the angle is, we're going to end up with a value. And we're just going to end up with a bunch of dots, which is going to connect the dots, and we're going to end up with a waveform like this. All right. So let's see here. Let get rid of the calculator. Come back to this slide. Come on. Shift F5, F5, oh, really? Let me get that slide here, oh, come on. There. That was our slide. So now we're going, we're working uh, with rotating that. Okay, so we're going to come up with that. So let's see the other, basically here, this slide. All right. 
this slide basically talks about what I just showed you right here. It's just a different perspective on it, but we're talking about the same thing. If you go back and if you just listen to or watch it again and again and again, if you, uh, if you have a problem with getting it, at first it might be a little bit intimidating, or maybe not, okay? Then you're going to end up with something like this here. So here's the um, uh, BLV right here. See that? Here's the E that goes BLV. But now we have to multiply by the cosine of the, how much the angle has changed from that. So that's the omega T right now. So this is change the angle over time. Uh, and you, uh, sometimes you're going to give this in radians, but the radians are useless to us in this point because since we're operating with degrees, we have to make sure that we operate with degrees because if you uh, I don't know, uh, if you multiply apples and by oranges, you're not going to get anything uh, anything of value. So same thing. If you work with radians, work with radians all the time. Uh, all the way through. If you work with degrees, make sure you are doing this thing with the degrees. So over here, uh, basically we have the strength of the field. We have the length of the conductor, which is the active length of the conductor, which is the length that is exposed to the magnetic field that it cuts on the right angle. Right? And then we have to multiply, uh, and then we have the speed that this thing travels, but depending on the angle, so depending wherever that thing is around the circle that it travels around, it travels at the different speed in reference to the left and right. Yeah, okay. So that's why we call it angular speed. So that's the fraction that is going to give us here, control P here for, oops, control P for pen. Where are we? Over here. Uh, That is going to be the fraction. So this is the cosine of the angle from that the angle varies. Like if this is here, if this is, well, no, sorry. Here is the north and south. So because right now we are revolving the magnetic field. So, well, we could have the magnetic field. We can have the, um, the, um, uh, conductor spin around the magnetic field from top to bottom, or we could have the magnetic field rotating around the conductor. It's the same thing. We are making a relative motion of the conductor versus a magnetic field. So over here, you just have to uh, turn your brain inside out in order to get this picture right here. Okay. Instead of rotating the conductor, we are rotating the magnetic field. So everything is going, to, it's, the, it's basically the same thing. And over here is the excitation field. So uh, we don't need to even pay attention to that. But over here, we have the uh, magnetic field. So now the magnetic field normally here would, would be going from north to south. So it's going to be pointing that way in a straight line, perpendicular, right, that way here. If that was aligned, if that rotor was aligned straight, yeah. Okay. But now the rotor has turned. So now we have the angle, which is the change of the angle over time. And we can apply the cosine of that angle in order to create a fraction, which is going to give, uh, where is it? Uh, here I am, which is going to be this fraction right here, this fraction right here. So still we have the field, the magnetic field strength, okay, right here. We have the length, when we have the actual velocity going left and right cutting the field at the right angle. Where's the two come from? Okay, here. Because we have a loop, we have a conductor here and we have a conductor here. So if you have, if you, uh, if there's a, if there's a, a coil, so we have to consider this length here 
of the coil and that is going to be around here too okay so we have to consider this length and that length so that's where the two comes from so, so this this way this is going to give you the top conductor is going to give you a peak value going one way and at the same time when the other conductor cuts the south pole it's also going to give you a peak value the other way so that's basically the idea of um, of the angular velocity so now let me just uh, come back here uh, how do we uh, erase this whole thing control erase there erase that erase that erase that after all that i have explained to you you should have no problem understanding this formula right here because if you just look at this formula if you look at this formula uh well, okay where's the two coming from okay because we have two conductors one and the other right uh then uh um uh, what do we have the B, the strength of the magnetic field that this rotor uh, uh, is introducing, it's hitting that conductor with, or the, it's going to create a revolving magnetic field. So it's either the conductor spins around the magnetic field or the magnetic field spins around the conductor, doesn't matter. So this here, it's easier because uh, we can just magnetize the rotor and accomplish the same thing as if you know, one, six or half a dozen the other, okay? Uh, so, uh, so here is the formula. This is the fraction that we might have to multiply that because between here and here, that, con that magnetic field or the, 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 the displacement of the magnetic field in reference to the conductor is going to be slower anywhere here it's going to be a fraction of it until it comes to zero because over here this way or that way it doesn't go it's just at the moment at it's very very short undefined moment because it's a circle it stops and it just keeps going that way here okay. that's the angular velocity that's applied in reference to a spinning or rotating elements around the, uh, the conductors around the magnetic field all right. right so uh now it moves from the moment of inertia right well um we are looking at this i hope i'm going to answer your question we're looking at this thing when this thing is in, in at the proper speed already so we're just kind of taking a snapshot of time okay. So now we have, what do we have here? We have one coil, A to A. We have another coil, B to B. So here's, here's one loop, here's another loop. And here's a third loop. And guess what? We have displaced them 120 degrees apart. Because the first, we're just, there was just one coil in the stator. It's going to give us a waveform. But now we have three independent ones that this rotating magnetic field hits one after the other, one after the other. So you can look at those three coils as one whole piece, or you can look at them as each individual coil, and each individual coil is going to give you this waveform, but it's going to be shifted 120 degrees that way and 120 degrees that way. And altogether, you're going to have three waveforms. So we have one phase, second phase, and three phases. So that's how we are able to accomplish a three-phase three phase generator. Okay, what do we have? Three-phase winding. Um, 
and they are 120 degrees apart. So remember that, uh, uh, okay, so here is the EMF induced at that instance for the phase A. Okay, so here. All right. In the beginning here, when this thing is, uh, when this rotor is aligned completely vertically, we are just going to have zero degrees between that phase, that conductor, and the magnetic field lines. So it's cutting. The, the, the velocity is cutting at the right angle here. But the angle between the magnetic fields and the rotor, the magnetic field and the, uh, and the, the, the when it's kind of, so the angle of the normal, which is between the normal, which is our normal is the angle, is the line that uh, of the magnetic field. So when it fa travels the fastest, that is going to be the normal here for us. So everything comes from the normal, it's going to create an angle which means it's going to create travel slower. But here, it's, that's going to give us the peak value. So the, here's the peak value times the fraction that we're able to accomplish by calculating the cosine of that angle that this thing travels with. Yeah. So now it's under this angle. So here, it's going to be a fraction. Then, at the same time, at the same time, the B value here, see this is, it goes 120 degrees, okay, A and B here. That's from here to here is 120 degrees. And because it's going to the counterclockwise, so we have to subtract the angle. So that means we're going to have the instant value, when this thing is at its full value, we don't have to uh, calculate anything because the cosine of zero degrees is one and the displacement is zero. So one minus zero. So it's gonna be the peak value times the cosine of times one minus zero. Excuse me, so, we can't see the screen. Oh, sorry. <laughs> All right, here, whoa, all right. So here is, uh, thank you for letting, just if you let that happens again, uh, just let me know right away, please, okay? Um, I apologize. So over here, at, when this thing is lined up right here, there's no angle. So this thing travels fastest. So the peak value that we have, we can just calculate the speed if we calculate the circumference and divide it by the minutes per second uh, to make the second out of minutes, and you could have that peak value. But everything else, you only you won't be able to do that. You have to get that peak value and multiply multiply by the fraction that uh, uh, that uh, gives us the cosine of the angle here. All right. So at this time, the cosine of the angle is one. So basically, the instant value of this EMF induced is equal to the peak value. This doesn't even exist, but it's just written here, right? Now, uh, the, at the same time that this thing is happening, at this very instant, then the is going to be the, the, the phase B, which is turned 120 degrees that way, is going to be the peak value times the cosine, of that angle, but we have to make sure that we subtract the 120 degrees because we are turning it. Right? And then at the same time, you're going to have the, um, uh, the C phase, phase number three, is going to be the value of that, the fraction of that, because we are dealing with two uh, fractions. So that 
minus 120 degrees. So that's going to be the fraction that you have to multiply over here. That's going to be the fraction, the cosine of the whatever angle. So at this time, we have this angle here. So whatever the cosine of this angle is going to be the fraction for the peak value at the A, right? Because that's our reference, the phase A. Phase B, same thing, but we have to multiply, uh, we have to uh, multiply by the fraction. We have to shift it 120 degrees. And of course, 120 degrees plus 120 degrees is going to be 240. So we're going to have to multiply it by the fraction that this will give us. Because So we're shifting. Here's a zero degrees phase shift. Here's a 120 degrees phase shift. There's a 220 degrees phase shift. So that's how we can calculate the values. And we're going to end up with, with this here. So here's phase one, then 120 degrees later. Uh, let's see here, uh, here, over here. 120 degrees later is the phase two. 120 degrees later is the phase three. Now, if you really want to uh, uh, be cute about that, <clears throat> the average value at pretty much any instant is going to come up to pretty much almost like zero. Yeah. The average is the average values with the three phases. Uh, just uh, you know, if you want to humor yourself uh, at uh, whatever, uh, pick an angle and do those calculations here and see what the averages are going to be. If you if if you just draw a line here. At any point, it's going to come up to zero. So that's how efficient, uh, that's how efficient three-phase generator is. All right. Now, um, uh, the construction of the synchronous generator here. So we have a three-phase windings. Uh, so phase A, phase B, phase C, which is uh, what we just did here. Phase A, phase B phase C and they're 120 degrees apart, all right? Uh, physical location, 120 degrees apart. And that's what basically looks like. This is a, a stator of a synchronous machine here. And here is one winding here in red. Here's another winding. And here's a third winding here. And they are 120 degrees apart and they're arranged for the most efficiency. And inside there, you're going to have a spinning rotor. And remember uh, when we are calculating the number of poles, we're going to tackle it next time we see each other. Um, uh, how is that uh, um, you know, the number of poles? Because over here, how many poles do we have in this rotor? Anybody? How many poles do we have here? That should be easy. No, poles in this rotor that rotates. We have two poles. We have North Pole and we have South Pole. If we add one more, if we cross uh, crisscross it with another one, we're going to have four poles. We're going to have North, South, and North and South. Okay. So just to give you a heads up, Uh, it takes one complete cycle, let's say this South Pole here, or the North Pole, if it goes one full rotation for one of the phases, right, that's going to give you one full cycle right, of a waveform. Because when the, this, at the point one here, Okay, this this point. When this magnetic field that acts on that spot, if it completely changes from north to south, it will give you a full cycle. But if you introduce another part of the router, it is going to change from north to south in half the time. Actually, yeah. Excuse sir. Yes. Um, we have a class at five. I'm not, I'm not we got a class at five. five. Okay. Yeah. So uh, yeah, I'm just going to wrap it up here, and uh, if you need to leave, just go ahead and leave. And uh, I'm going to post that and give you the link for that for for this. So if uh, there's any 
couple minutes that you have to uh, uh, to watch. Just 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 hit that couple minutes when I when I post it. Okay, you guys have been great. You have to leave. Go ahead. I'm just going to. It's going to take me uh, probably two minutes to wrap this one up. Okay, thank you and you're welcome. All right. So uh, so that's basically what it looks like. That's what it looks like in reality as well here. Um, now. Um, how do we create the magnetic field? Because the magnetic field, revolving magnetic field is created by this rotating, revolving rotor. Yeah. And when the rotor rotates, it hits those, uh, those points at the, those windings, the stator windings uh, with the magnetic field and thus generating the electricity or the EMF, electromotive force. So <clears throat> we can magnet, uh, it has to be magnetic. All right, so there are two ways. You could have a permanent magnet, or you could have the field pole winding. Remember that? Uh, we actually um, uh, measured the resistance during our lab. So that's the excitation. Uh, you can have an electromagnet. So you could just have a metal rod here. And if you put, un, like not magnetized, all right. And if you put a coil around it, you apply DC voltage to it to make this DC current flow through it, you're going to create a magnet out of that. This is a better way of doing it because you have control over how much you want to magnetize this. And thus, uh, we're going to, uh, uh, next time we're going to see each other, we're going to uh, talk about the number of poles uh, and versus speed, how that affects the speed of the motor. Um, um, and or the, uh, the frequency of a generator. And uh, we're going to talk about something that's how much, how much current can we run through this metal rod? And when we hit this thing with more current, we magnetize it more. We hit this thing with more current, we magnetize it even more. We hit this thing with more current, we magnetize it even more but there's only so much that this metal rod can take and it's going to saturate itself. It's going to only be able to magnetize itself so much. At, at some point we've hit the saturation point, um, we can keep adding current, but the rod, is, won't, the rod won't be able to, or the metal rod is not going to be able to uh, magnetize itself more, give us more magnetism. So that's where it's called a saturation point. And uh, that's why we, during our lab, you are asked to produce something that's called a saturation curve. And it's going to look like this, right? It's not going to be linear forever. It's going to be kind of like, that way here. It's, so at first, when you hit this thing with some current, it's going to give you a response right away. More response is going to be the response is going to be quite uh, quite comparable to the uh, amount of current that you're shooting through. But then at some point, no matter how much more current you're hitting this thing with, it's just going to give you just a little bit more change. At, finally, it's not going to change at all. All right. So that's the saturation point. Right? All right, so uh, one, uh, one other thing here is that um, here's a low speed and hydro generator. So with the hydro generator, we are uh, able to accomplish low speed of uh, the rotor turning. So if we have a low speed of turning, we have to come up with a bigger diameter. So the angular velocity magnitude is going to be um, bigger on the outside because the bigger is so if you have the rotate, if you rotate that uh, certain amount here, uh, then it, the further you go around, the velocity is going to be uh, greater, right? So that's, you know, that's just basic law of physics here. And uh, because you have the greater velocity, we're going to be able to generate the more current when you hit the stator winding, okay? Um, now, if you have more speed, you can uh, afford to have a, a, a smaller diameter because it's going to turn faster. So you don't have to have as much velocity, angular velocity uh, on the outside of the circle, right? Uh, so uh, diameter versus length, of the um, uh, 
the length of the um, uh, conductors as well, right? So you have a low speed, diameter goes huge, uh, bigger, and the length, uh, you don't need to have the length as much. Uh, you know, they just, uh, they're just inversely proportional with each other here, right? Now, when you have the uh, steam turbine, <coughs> excuse me, uh, then uh, the steam turbine is going to uh, spin much faster. So that means you can afford to have less diameter to accomplish the same angular velocity on the outside of this circle here. Right? So that's the... Uh, um, that's the uh, that's the end of this uh, class. What else do we have here at the end of this slideshow here? So as a summary, in synchronous generator, we the input that we apply to that machine is a mechanical power, and the output that we're getting is the electricity or three phase electricity. In a synchronous machine, we have a rotor, we have a stator and we have a field and the rotor and stator field, there we go, see? Not the stator, but the stator field rotate at the same time, at uh, the same speed. So uh, uh, the stator is a stationary thing. There are coils, the windings, they stay. But when we do the rotor, we're going to create the field that, uh, that we're going to synchronize with the rotor field. Right. The construction stator is three phase windings. Rotor is a magnetic field. High speed machines, we would have at the, speed, at the steam turbine, for example. The diameter of the rotor is going to be less because the high speed and the length of the, uh, of the active length of the conductors is going to be, the, the, the windings are going to be bigger. Uh, the, the low speed, uh, for example, hydro uh, uh, power plants, they're going to have the diameter bigger because of the speed is lower and uh, we'll need uh, longer uh, as well, longer um, um, active wire lengths. Okay, there are the references and so on. Okay, thank you guys for staying with me here and uh, I will see you next time. So uh, was it Thursday or something like that? Uh, uh, I think it's Thursday, or whatever it is. I'm going to see some of you uh, uh, during uh, during our lab sessions, okay? Stay healthy and safe, and I'll see you when I see you, whenever that is going to be. Thank you.